came about from talking to delegated investors in commercial real estate and sitting in on their conferences. And I kept hearing the same conversation over and over again, which was about certain cities that they were very focused on. And so I sort of started picking their brain, you know, why not this city? Why not that city? And I'm picking on Pittsburgh a little bit with the title of the paper, but in part, there's nothing really obviously wrong with Pittsburgh. It has this beautiful natural landscape. It's got two world-class universities. It's a healthcare hub. It's got multiple major league sports teams. And it's really well-educated. And yet it's really unattractive to delegated investors. So it's 37 out of 39 of the cities in my sample on the share of commercial real estate purchases made by delegated investors. So it's only about 14% of all purchases are delegated investors. And so the paper is gonna look at this phenomenon more broadly in a broader set of cities. So it's basically about this graph. So what you see here on the x-axis is the turnover. So this is the percent of the commercial real estate stock that gets sold every year. So it's measured in square feet. On the y-axis is the share of commercial real estate purchases that are made by delegated investors. And you can see that Pittsburgh is down on the far corner. Uh, so only about 2% of the stock of commercial real estate in Pittsburgh turns over. And again, low share of purchases made by delegated investors. So the first thing I wanna do in this paper is just to document this relationship. I'm next going to show you that the delegated investors actually do have a preference for cities where commercial real estate turns over more frequently. And then I'm going to use an over-the-counter search model to explain these facts. So the explanation in a nutshell is that in commercial real estate, delegated investors have higher liquidity needs, meaning that they experience more frequent valuation shocks. In the context of a search model, they get hit with these valuation shocks more frequently than direct investors. So direct investors are investors that are managing money on their own behalf, so family offices, for example. Empirically, I'm gonna show that delegated investors have shorter holding periods. That's consistent with these higher liquidity needs. The main reason is likely a principal agent conflict between investors and their managers. I'm not going to give you micro foundations for that. I'm just gonna assume that that's why we have this uh, higher liquidity needs. So we're just gonna show that the high, the, they have uh, shorter holding periods. So knowing this, if you know ex ante that you have higher liquidity needs, you're going to choose markets that have more frequent transactions, right? You're gonna want an exit strategy. So one of the things I heard over and over again was, well, I don't go into cities like Pittsburgh because I need an exit strategy. You have no exit strategy in a city like Pittsburgh. If you know you need one, you choose a city like Austin, which has actually a fair bit of turnover. But this actually implies a lot of path dependence. So you get this liquidity begets liquidity effect because even if the assets were, even if the cities were identical at some point in time, once you concentrate investors in one set of cities, that means those cities are going to have more frequent transactions. So why do we care? So it's already been brought up that we know that there's a higher share of capital going to delegated managers. And what this has meant is that it's especially prominent in publicly traded equities. So we're, I expect we're going to continue to see that the share of capital managed by delegated investors is going to continue go, to go into publicly traded equity. You can't rapidly increase allocations to alternatives because you need a certain concentration of delegated managers in an asset class for it to be considered an institutional quality asset. It also may affect urban design in the sense that Delegated investors also differ in the size of their investment. So the main difference in the type of properties they buy is they like really large properties consistent with, you know, they've got a whole bunch of capital that they want to deploy and they like to do it on a $100 million building rather than 10 $10 million buildings. So this means that you may actually see differences in what sort of cities develop because of the ability to attract capital. And finally, I'm going to be able to quantify illiquidity premium in commercial real estate using the model. Big caveat on this, I'm, hurt, I'm sure that Tim is going to tear that apart because there's a lot of assumptions that go into this, but hopefully it's a first attempt. So the data in this paper comes from real capital analytics. It's transaction level data on every purchase and, and sale in commercial real estate in 39 MSAs over 2001 to 2015. 
commercial real estate, I mean office, industrial, and retail. They also provide me cap rates. So these are uh, dividend yields, what we call a dividend yield in commercial real estate, at the MSA level by property type. The denominator for trade frequency is going to be the stock of commercial real estate measured in square feet. This comes from CBRE. C CBRE is a broker in commercial real estate. I wanted to measure turnover in terms of square feet because it's hard to sort of think about the value of the stock of commercial real estate that is not transacting. Raj, can I take your question at the end? Oh, metropolitan statistical area. Sorry, city, city. You can think of this as a city. Uh, that said, if you assume, if you wanted to assume that the stock of commercial real estate is worth the average price per square foot, you get broadly similar results. So one of the big advantages of RCA's data is that they've standardized the buyer name. So what that means is I don't have to worry about Washington Mutual showing up as Washington Mutual, WAMU, WAMU, et cetera. So that they've invested a lot of resources into standardizing the buyer name. What I'm going to do is I'm going to classify all buyers for which I see at least five transactions. That covers about 73% of purchases by dollar volume. When you get below five transactions, it's really hard to actually see what this buyer truly is. You know, it's probably just an LLC, and it's really hard to understand who they truly are. So I'm just going to call the rest of buyers small. Delegated managers, the key distinction in classifying these, I have a, a, a set of subclassifications of investors, but the key distinction is are you managing your own money or are you managing somebody else's money? And again, the idea is that there may be something like redemption requests or a maximum holding period, or in the case of PE funds, there's often compensation of the manager contingent upon liquidating the investment. What they don't do if you have an investment manager, they don't just, the, the, the investors don't usually say, you know, you just sell whenever you think it's right. You know, 10 years, 20 years, you just, we'll just leave it up to you. They don't usually let you do that. So there, you face some limit on how long you can hold a property. So the benchmark definition of delegated investors includes PE funds, investment managers, banks, and pension funds. Sometimes the distinction between PE funds and investment managers is a little gray, but it doesn't really matter because I put them both into this delegated camp. REITs are in their own category. So there's a reason I call it delegated and not institutional investors. REITs actually have to hold properties for a minimum of four, of four years to be considered a REIT for tax purposes. And so they actually have to have long hold, holding periods, unlike other delegate investors. So the first thing I want to show you is the difference between the holding periods of direct and delegate investors. So the top panel is all purchases, 2001 to 2015. You don't see a big difference there, but that's because most properties are not sold by the end of the sample. If I can find the analysis to 2001 to 2003 purchases, then on average, delegate investors are holding a property for about two years less. And then at the 50th percentile, you can see that they're actually holding it for about six years less. So unconditionally, without looking at any sort of property characteristics or where they're investing, delegate investors have holding periods that are about two years shorter on average. You're probably thinking, this is censored on both the left and the right. You're right. So let's run Tobit regressions. So the dependent variable here is the holding period, again, censored both on the left and the right. And I'm regressing it on whether the purchase was made by a delegated investor. So in the first column, uh, the only controls I have are year fix effects. And you can see that on average, delegated investors hold a property for about 0.6 years less. The next column, I'm going to add uh, buyer size quintiles and then a set of controls for which city property size, the property type, the property age. And then RCA produces these quality scores. This is an alternative to, you may have heard the terms A, B, and C class property. The lines are a bit fuzzy, so instead they come up with this gradient of quality, this continuous measure. Not much difference, though. Delegated investors are holding about 0.7 years less. In the third column, I split delegate investors into the subcomponents, and you can see that most of the effect is being driven by investment managers. 
slightly lesser uh, effect for, uh, so, sorry, by PE funds. Investment managers, the coefficient is a little bit smaller, as well as banks. Not an effect for pension funds, consistent with your priors on pension funds being uh, long investors. The last column, what I'm doing is I'm only going to look at the set of properties that are sold by the end of the sample, because you might be concerned about weird things going on with properties that all, with the censoring on the right-hand side. And you still see the same effect. Delegated investors hold about half a year less. So getting back to this graph, you can think of a whole bunch of stories about what's going on. You know, San Francisco is a big city. San Jose is a big city. Uh, Boston's a fairly big city, so maybe it's about size. You can think about well-educated cities. You can think about a whole bunch of stories. So what I want to do is, is look at some very obvious explanations for this relationship. So largest cities, maybe delegate investors only can invest in cities that are very large so we can control for population. The biggest story I've heard, though, is actually about credit tenants. So delegate investors, often they say, I need a tenant in the building that is a publicly traded company. Publicly traded company. They like these tenants because they can take it to their investment board and the cash flows from a publicly traded company as a lease, it's just like a bond, right? So if you have Target as a tenant, that's basically Target credit in your cash flows as a landlord. What might not, what, what was a little bit difficult about this is that most publicly traded companies have employment in a number of locations other than their headquarters. So YTS is establishment level employment data. And what I did is I went and aggregated all the establishment level employment to the MSA level that was linked to a publicly traded firm. And that's Pub Empshire. I also used the assets from CompuStat in the headquarters uh, of, of firms in that MSA. And then there's a bunch of economic fundamentals, like the share that are college educated, uh, diversification across industries, the overall level of competition among firms, and then you can just use MSA level GDP growth. So what I'm regressing here, you should think of this as multivariate correlations. I'll when you get to the model, you'll see that these things are jointly determined. But So think of this as multivariate correlations for the time being. So I'm regressing delegated share in an MSA on trade frequency and then a number of controls, including these economic fundamentals. And you can see that the first column, the only controls here are year fixed effects. Second column, I control for population as well as the publicly traded share of employment in that MSA and the economic fundamentals. Third column, I'm using CompuStat assets of firms, publicly traded firms headquartered in that MSA. Fourth column, I'm using GDP growth directly. And then the final column, I'm actually, instead of using the share of purchases, I'm using the share of sales in an MSA. In all columns, you can see that trade frequency continues to be highly significant, and college. So in, uh, delegate investors seem to prefer to invest in cities that are more highly educated. The publicly traded employment doesn't seem to be quite as big a predictor as I would have expected. So the MSA level relationship between delegated investor share and trade frequency is jointly determined. To actually see that delegated investors prefer cities with higher trade frequency, I want to look at the transaction level data. And I want to look at within a property, so conditional on a transaction, can I see that the property was more likely to be purchased by a delegated investor in higher trade frequency cities? The key measures of trade frequency, so the first is average trade frequency in an MSA year. The other one I want to look at is average trade frequency in an MSA property type. The reason I want to look at this is for a lot of investors, they may only invest in industrial property or they may only be in retail property. And so the relevant market for them is maybe not a whole MSA, but something within a property type. I'm going to average across all years because some of the smaller cities, there's a lot of volatility year to year. And then the third one is the first half of the sample, the trade frequency in that MSA. This is a super persistent variable, but you might think that an investor that's starting to invest in, say, 2008, they may be looking at historical trade frequency to get a sense of how much liquidity is in that market. And what you see here is it does continue to be the case. It's a little bit less significant when we look at the transaction level data. But it, is, it continues to be the case that a purchase is more likely to be made by a delegated investor in these higher trade frequency cities. 
even college becomes a little bit less significant because that might not be a good proxy for an individual property. Final thing I want to show you about the data is dividend yield. So we call these again cap rates in commercial real estate. And you can see that they are higher in the less liquid cities, right? This is consistent with uh, an illiquidity premium. So San Francisco, Austin, San Jose, lower cap rates than uh, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Salt Lake City. But it's not a big spread. If you look at the axis, the y-axis ranges from about six, New York City's an outlier for reasons I don't have time to talk about, uh, up to eight and a half percent. So we're really talking about a fairly small spread in dividend yields. And this is not even looking at risk, right? This is just unadjusted data. You can, you'd think, if anything, that the fact that Detroit would, might seem like a risky city. If anything, you'd expect that you'd see more dispersion in cap rates. But there's a fairly small level of dispersion in cap rates. OK, so the explanation is market segmentation by liquidity preference. So this is a simplified version of the Vionis and Wang model. We can think of two cities, one and two, and they're ex-ante identical. There's a fixed supply of the asset in each market, and the asset is going to pay $1 in every period. It's riskless, so there's no credit risk in this model. Each period a set of investors is born. It enters the economy. When it's born, the investor values the asset at its full dividend, $1 per period, but it doesn't own the asset. So it's born valuing the asset, but it doesn't own it. We call these uh, agents buyers. Buyers randomly meet sellers at rate lambda. And investors are randomly going to get shocks at a rate kappa that instead of valuing the asset at one, the dividend at a dollar, if you get hit with one of these shocks, you value it at a dollar minus x. They become sellers after they get hit with this shock, right? You can see right away the buyers, there's a set of agents out there that value at a dollar. There's a set of agents that own the asset, the value at $1 minus x, these people should meet. But they're heterogeneous. So you are born into this economy with kappa stamped on your forehead. So you know, for example, um, you know, Raj is born with kappa 4%. And Chester is born with kappa 7%. And so you know ex ante what, how frequently you're going to get these valuation shocks. And knowing that, you have to choose which of these two markets to search in. You don't get to look in both Austin and Pittsburgh. You have to choose which of these markets you want to look in. Why do you have to choose between these markets? You can think of this as an informational cost of learning anything about the market, right? It takes a lot of time to learn something about the fundamentals of Austin and Pittsburgh. But you don't get to start searching in both markets and then make a decision. You only search in one. Once an investor has sold the asset or becomes a low valuation agent that does not own the asset, he exits the economy. So this is not like the Duffy Garland O'Peterson paper where you're switching back and forth between high and low. Once you get the hit with this shock, you're permanently a low valuation agent. So Byron and Wang have this lemma that shows that there's a unique value of kappa, kappa star, such that all investors with kappa above kappa star, so kappa star could be something like 6%. Anybody who has that kappa above cap, that kappa star is going to go to one market, and anybody with a kappa on the other side goes to the other market. There's also going to be a continuum of symmetric equilibria, where prices in the, uh, for the assets in both markets are the same. That's not interesting here. But the other thing to take away is that welfare is actually higher under this clientele equilibrium. So finally, I want to calibrate the US commercial real estate. Uh, I want to calibrate this model, the US commercial real estate market. What I'm doing here is I'm going to choose parameters to match volumes and cap rates in the commercial real estate market. So you can see that what I've done, because in my model, I actually have 39. In my world, I have 39 cities, not two. So I'm going to split the sample into high and low turnover markets. Average cap rate in high turnover markets is 7.51%. Average turnover in low turnover markets is 7.74%. Much bigger dispersion in turnover across these two markets. The model matches these nearly perfectly. That's by design. What is not by design is the months to sell. 
In the high turnover market, it takes about nine months to sell a property once you've been hit by a shock. So you should think of this as once I, if I own the property, I get hit with a shock, how long before I can sell the property? On average, it's about nine months. In the low turnover market, it's about 12 months. And the illiquidity premium, so relative to a perfectly liquid asset with the same credit risk, 206 basis points in the high turnover market and 228 basis points in the low turnover market. Okay, so just to wrap up the key facts here, delegate investors have shorter holding periods than direct investors. Cities where delegate investors dominate have higher turnover. A model with heterogeneity investors' preferences over liquidity can explain these city-level facts. The model indicates that the illiquidity premium for commercial real estate relative to a perfectly liquid asset with similar credit risk is about 200 basis points. So to get back to the title of the paper, what's wrong with Pittsburgh? If you're a delegate investor, what's wrong with Pittsburgh is that commercial real estate does not trade frequently enough for you. The broader implication is what makes an asset appropriate for an institutional investor is the concentration of other institutional investors in that market. Thank you.